Hello, everyone, and welcome to session one of our virtual Marine Money Ship Finance Week, coming to you live from our offices in Singapore and New York. Although we would have loved to be with you in person, in times like these, we have no other choice but to resume our networking and intelligence sharing online. Before I introduce the topic of session one and our speakers, I would like to thank all of our partner and sponsors and supporters of our virtual Marine Money Ship Finance Week. I am your host, Andrew Oates, and today I'm very happy to introduce to you our moderator, Abhishek Pandey, Global Head of Shipping Finance at Standard Chartered Bank, and our panelists, Caroline Yang, President at the Singapore Shipping Association, Wei Ting Tan, Director of International Maritime Center at the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore, Alice Chen Chen Gui, Director of Equity Capital Markets, Global Sales and Origination at the Singapore Exchange, and Su Ling Lu, head of the Baltic Exchange in Asia. For the seventh consecutive year, Singapore has retained its position as the world's most important international shipping center on the Xinhua Baltic International Shipping Center Development Index. This position is attributable to the geographical location, shipping industry ecosystem, and supportive government policies, as well as the Maritime and Port Authority support and investment in maritime education, R&D, and new technologies for shipping. Before I hand over the floor to Abhishek, a couple of ground rules. The audience will be on mute during this webinar to ensure quality control. You should have a control panel, which pops up on the right of your screen. If you wish to ask a question, you simply need to enter your question in the box at the bottom of the control panel where it says questions. I will receive them and at the end of the webinar, I will ask the questions on your behalf. You can also collapse the menu by clicking on the little arrow on the top of the control panel. I will now hand over the floor to Abhishek to begin this discussion. Abhishek. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome everyone. Good morning and good evening at the same time to wherever you're based. The first panel today is Singapore, a premier paradigm cluster, innovative hub for shipping, global example of state support for a critical industry. We have an all powered women panel actually, and, um, and, and all from Singapore. So my heartiest welcome to the, to the panelists. I will just give a quick download on, on brief uh, bio of each one of them. We have Carolina, who's the CEO of England Marine PD Limited and also the president of uh, SSA. Uh, she's an LLB honors from University of London and holds a BA honors degree from NUS. She was called to the Bar of England in 1992 and Bar of Singapore in 1995. She has almost 30 years of experience in the industry and was elected as the first female president of SSA in 2019. Thank you, Caroline, for joining us. Then we have uh, Wei Ting Tan, who is the Deputy Director of uh, MPA, the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. She's studied accounting in NTU, worked as a tax consultant for five years in Ernst & Young and Arthur Anderson between 1999 and 2004. She's been with MPA ever since, so over the past 15 years. Welcome, Wei Ting Tan. Then we have got Alice Kui. She is the Director of Equity Capital Markets Global Sales and Origination at SGX. Graduated in 1996, again from NUS, with a honors degree in business administration. She did her MBA from Texas Tech University in 99. Her career has been spent mostly in finance, spanning across investment banking, corporate and commercial banking, ship finance, aircraft finance, and project finance. Currently in SGX, she covers healthcare, maritime, offshore, and energy, oil and gas sectors with the equity capital markets. Last but not the least, we have Su Ling Liu, who is the head of the Baltic Exchange in Asia, Bachelor of Commerce from University of Melbourne in Australia, and a chartered accountant by training. She has been uh, with the SGX, which is the parent of, of Baltic Exchange uh, from 2001, and has held various roles, including the COO at the Energy Market Company, which is another SGX subsidiary and in corporate strategy and business development. She is now responsible for growing Baltic exchange business in Asia. And with that introduction, I would invite Su Ling actually to, to launch the uh, panel discussion with the few states that she has put together for us. Su Ling. Thank you, Abhishek, and uh, greetings everyone. Um, I would like to thank Marine Money for inviting me to join this panel. I am pleased and honored to be in such an illustrious uh, company 
all the sweeter since it's all uh, ladies. <laughs> Um, as a backdrop, before we get into the panel discussion, I've been asked to share some findings from the Xinhua Baltic 2020 International Shipping Centre Development Index, which is an independent ranking of the world's largest shipping centres. This is the seventh time that the Baltic Exchange uh, and Xinhua, uh, China's state news agency, have collaborated to produce a report that looks at the performance of the world's top maritime cities. I must caveat that this year's report is based primarily on 2019 data and reflects a world that was not yet impacted by COVID-19. We have evaluated 43 shipping centres in our report and almost half, uh, that is 20, are in the Asia Pacific, including two in Australia. 12 are in Europe, eight are in the Americas and three are in Africa. These shipping centers were selected based on a combination of factors such as port throughput, the size of the port economic hinterland, and level of development of shipping services. For instance, there are emerging ship, uh, port cities in Asia Pacific with fairly large throughput and that have been excluded because they are weak in shipping services. And on the other hand, some ports may have a relatively small throughput but have been included as they have a high standard of shipping services and a good business operating environment. Some port cities in Europe and the Americas fall into this category. So in our report, we aim to measure the level of development of shipping centers using simple, intuitive, objective, and impartial criteria. So the emphasis is on using real operational data that can be tested and verified. We have conducted our evaluation based on three primary indicators, that is the port factors, shipping services, and general environment, and 17 underlying secondary indicators. This helps to comprehensively reflect the state of development of international shipping centers. So port factors accounts for 20% of the weighting, and that looks at things like port capacity, so port throughput, dry bulk, uh, wet cargo throughput, the number of cranes, um, the length of berths and the port draft. Uh, shipping services accounts for a significant percentage, 50%, and that encompasses um, the, it looks at the number of players in areas such as ship broking, ship engineering, ship management, legal services, and shipping finance. And the other 30% looks at the general environment. So uh, factors such as transparency, uh, about rules, plans, and processes the extent of e-service use in uh, public services, uh, economic freedom, tariffs, uh, ease of doing business, and logistics performance, by which we mean, for instance, the efficiency of customs clearance, uh, the quality of trade and transport infrastructure, and so on. So the data that is used in the report was obtained from various sources, uh, including what's list, juries, UN, World Bank. Many of these are authoritative sources uh, in the world of shipping and business. So looking at the performance, uh, the rankings of the last five years, um, starting in 2020, of course, Singapore uh, has maintained its position as the most important shipping hub in the Asia Pacific region and in the world. It has ranked first for seven consecutive years. Now, Singapore has unparalleled advantages uh, with regards to geographical location, uh, shipping industry ecosystem, and uh, supportive government policies. London, with advantages accruing from providing high-end ship, shipping finance, insurance, and legal services, has climbed back to the second place in 2020, after dropping to third place in 2018 and 2019. And as the biggest port in terms of container throughput, Shanghai has seen a steady improvement in port facilities and shipping service levels, and has ascended to the top three for the first time. Um, if we can go back to the previous uh, slide, uh, Andrew, yeah, thank you. Uh, Hong Kong fell from uh, second to fourth place. Uh, this is mainly due to a slight decrease in cargo throughput and a, a drop in rankings relative to other centers in areas such as uh, ship brokerage, insurance, and legal services. And, and Dubai, as the preeminent shipping hub in the Middle East, ranked fifth for the third consecutive year. Uh, Rotterdam and Hamburg have also retained their positions. In, uh, since 2018, and they rank six and seven, respectively, uh, and benefiting from an improving business environment in areas such as government transparency and economic freedom and tariffs, uh, Athens rose to eighth. 
New York slipped by one place and Tokyo rose one place, uh, returning to the top 10. So if you compare the results over the last five years, centers featured in the top 10 have been quite stable, although we observe that Asian centers have generally climbed the ranks. So in 2016, there were two Asian centers in the top five, that's uh, Hong Kong and uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, and the rest were European. And if you look at 2020, three are Asian, that's uh, Singapore, Shanghai and Hong Kong, and there's only one European center, London. Uh, and of course, uh, Shanghai has steadily climbed the ranks from uh, sixth to third place. So we move to the next uh, slide, uh, which is my last slide. Uh, I will just um, take a few moments to talk about the top four centers. So Singapore uh, benefits from a strategic geographical location as it is situated along the Malacca Strait, which is an essential shipping passage con uh, connecting countries across Asia, Africa and Europe. And Singapore also has a comprehensive shipping industry ecosystem. It has congregated the greatest number of the world's international shipping groups. Uh, the other strength it has is it is a hub for commodity trading. So this helps to reinforce its strengths as shipping and trade business network. It also has strong service clusters for shipping insurance, maritime law and arbitration, ship financing, ship broking. And it has research and innovation capabilities through its universities, research centers, and as a hub for technology companies and startups. The Singapore government has played a vital role in facilitating its development with forward-looking planning, including the integration of the shipping industry chain and intelligent and green port technology. Uh, and Singapore's favorable business environment, supportive tariff policies, flexible and user-friendly registration and management system for ships and crew, as well as a variety of shipping-related incentives, all foster positive conditions for the shipping sector here. Uh, London. London developed into the world's first international shipping centre as Britain became the leader of global trade after the Industrial Revolution in the 1700s. Of course, London no longer has an absolute comparative advantage as a logistics hub, as the global supply uh, chain has uh, transformed. But nevertheless, uh, London continues to lead in uh, shipbroking, maritime insurance, shipping finance, maritime litigation and arbitration, maritime consulting and other maritime services. And many international maritime organizations, including the IMO, International Group of PNI Clubs, ICS, and the International Association of Classification Societies are headquartered in London. And the Baltic Exchange, which has a 275 year history in London, also retains its headquarters. Shanghai uh, is the most dynamic city in, uh, uh, in China, uh, nestled at the junction of China's coastline and the Yangtze River, and adjacent to the mainstream of the world's east west waterways. Shanghai enjoys a high transportation connectivity. And of course, the buoyant economic activities of China's hinterland generate huge demand for raw materials and export of goods. The government there has provided strong support to develop its sea and airports and to integrate its logistics and transport networks. And the government has also taken measures to improve the business environment and open up the shipping services industry to foreign players. Uh, and Hong Kong is a, a pivotal transit point for both east-west routes and north-south routes and plays an important role in connecting mainland China to international markets. And as an international financial center, it has deep cutting edge financing, leasing and insurance markets. And Hong Kong also benefits from being part of the development plan for the Greater Bay Area, which, which covers Guangdong, Hong Kong and Macau. Uh, I will now hand you back to Abhishek to kick off the panel discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Su Ling. Very insightful and, and thanks a lot for setting up the stage. Uh, so firstly, heartiest congratulations to Singapore actually for maintaining the position as the world's most important shipping center consecutively for seven years. So I guess well done to, to all of you and your organizations. Uh, this position is attributable as we heard just now, to factors like geography, industry ecosystem, favorable government policies, as well as the um, uh, MPA support and investment in maritime education, R&D, and new technologies for, for shipping. So waiting, perhaps you can share a bit more what MPA has done 
in the past 12 months on these three aspects of education, R&D, and, and, and tech predominantly? Hmm. Uh, sure, sure, Abhishek. Uh, first, let me thank uh, Marie Mani for inviting me to join this panel together with these wonderful ladies and of course Abhishek. Um, I think we are grateful for our position uh, for the past seven years and this really cannot be done by just MPA alone. Uh, in fact, you know, everybody in this panel has played a part in our own way um, to make sure that, you know, Singapore continues to be a conducive place for maritime uh, uh, businesses to be in. Um, you talked about uh, education as well as uh, R&D and technology. Maybe I'll just talk about the education first. Um, actually, education, uh, we have been focusing on education for a long time because human resources are our only resource in a very small country. So we need to place our resources in this place. Um, but, you know, given the current challenges right now faced by the industry, so what we have been doing over the past few months is also how do we ensure that there is a continuous pipeline of ready talent for the industry and also making sure that we can actually help the existing workforce be retrained or reskilled. So just as an example, um, MPA together with other government agencies um, and also work, we work with uh, the industry to provide 200 traineeships um, positions to fresh grads. Because if you are a fresh grad in the current situation, it's actually quite challenging for you to find jobs. But we want you to continue to be able to get experience and also uh, work in a company during this period. So that's why we are actually working on this front. Um, the other areas is then uh, where we direct our funding. Um, actually, we actually put together a Maritime SG together um, package that is like a financial support for the industry that amounted to about $27 million. And within this, we have also used part of it to fund uh, financial support for individual training. We, uh, MPA has this Maritime Master Fund that we actually do a co-sharing on a 50% basis for individuals who like to continue their um, you know, training, for example. And during this period, we have actually increased it up to 90%. So that you know, we can also take this time to continuously retrain yourself to make sure that you are ready uh, for the you know new norms that's coming, and also hopefully we get to the other side very soon. Um, you also talked about the uh, R and D and technology. Maybe I'll address this together. Um, actually, we believe that Singapore it is a good place for the maritime industry to come here to pilot uh, innovative or new technology, because in Singapore we don't just have maritime. Actually, we have uh, other clusters that's happening there. We have the traders, we have the financing. So they, they are also doing pursuing their own form of transformation. So we have fintech, for example. So this is something that we are also pursuing. And uh, just as uh, some examples, um, this is Marine Money, something that's related to financing. Just earlier this month at the, the Singapore Maritime Lecture, we have signed an MOU together with DBS, the local bank to drive um, digitalization and innovation of financial services and payment transactions across the maritime sector. So our focus is then, you know, how can we uh, remove some inefficiencies from the value chain so that we can actually uh, make things move faster, easier, and thereby having a positive impact to the bottom line. Um, then moving to the vessels part, uh, I think in October last year at the Global Maritime Forum, we at the sidelines, we have actually launched this thing called Digital Port at SG. So we are starting from ourselves, looking at Singapore when a vessel come calls here, how can we, what can we do to actually remove some inefficiencies? So what we have done is uh, we have actually set up this digital port SG as a portal to streamline, um, you know, all these clearances that you have to do, like immigration, port health, etc. when a vessel comes here. So instead of dealing with multiple people, multiple forms, I heard there's about 16, you just deal with one and then you transact and share the data. And we believe that this will be the new new way of doing business, a uh, new way of harnessing data and uh, going forward. And we also want to bring this across to other, because I believe, you know, in the, even the industry or other uh, nations, we are all trying to pursue our own transformation, putting together different uh, information points, etc. But what is important is that we must be able to share information and also to allow for the information to interoperate across um, different platforms. So we have also introduced something called um, digital oceans, which is something like a, it's an interoperable platform and an information hub to actually facilitate um, cross-border data exchanges and also to um, facilitate clearance authorities and also um, uh, uh, connections to other uh, national service, uh, national single windows. And we have also uh, invited partners because this is something that is important to do uh, with other partners. We have invited other five other international partners such as uh, Tagosmart, which is uh, the solution provider for um, GSBN, uh, and also uh, TradeLens, uh, 
Kalista that is represented by PSA and also the part of Rotterdam. So this is an example, a few examples of what we are trying to do by focusing on enabling data transfer and also to remove inefficiency. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Very interesting. I mean, that's 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 a lot of information, a lot of partnerships, and 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 a lot of uh, future pressure proofing, if we say right there. But but I uh, may may I just move in and ask that you know SSA has been there for 35 years, and and what uh, Weeting just said is is all the evolution that is in store for us, and and a lot of present. But you have 35 years of history uh, being here as an organization, and and also you know being uh, being the collective organization that could attest to, to whatever uh, MPA, MPA just explained with respect to initiatives. So where do you think is the draw, the main draw of the ship owners coming into Singapore? It, it, was, it was a lot of things like geography, it was services, uh, but there is also this future proofing, which is the digital agenda uh, that Weeting just explained. Do you think ship owners are looking forward to that? And they believe in it, and that is why the relevance of Singapore is is here to stay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, thank you, Marie Mani, for having me on board this uh, very esteemed panel. Uh, indeed, um, Singapore uh, SSA is celebrating its thirty fifth anniversary in twenty twenty. So, um, just now, as you hear from from waiting. You see, the government is very actively in promoting Singapore as a port. And just now, when Suling was um, showcasing the was presenting the slides, and I was looking at the three pillars where they do the um, the um, KPIs for 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 um, counting which is the best um, international maritime center. I feel for me is the third one, the third pillar. The third pillar is the one that brings the companies and the international companies into Singapore. So for me, it's the ease and the transparency, transparency of setting up and doing business in Singapore. And, and with the ease and transparency, it has many sub-factors, the proper infrastructure that is supporting it, the tax regime, the rules-based system that we have, and the very strong tripartite relationship between government, industry, and union. Of course, uh, the available talent, whether foreign or local, I think that is why Singapore is attractive as a, as a centre to do business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I kind of agree with you on that. I, I guess, you know, uh, there, is, there is obviously, uh, you know, an inherent uh, strength that Singapore provides, which is which is absolutely necessary, and that comes through the general environment, which which Baltic just put up, having a thirty percent weightage. But if I may just yeah. shift on to the fifty percent weightage of shipping services, I see there is shipping finance services, uh, which is which is there as financial services. Um, uh, it's one of the criteria, but because we have Alice uh, with us here, maybe let's, with your experience in SGX. Could you shed some insight into the latest developments within the Singapore financial markets, you know, including capital markets, perhaps uh, paying a bit more attention uh, towards the maritime space specifically? It'll be it'll be helpful to capture that dimension as well. Thank you, thank you, Abhishek. I would like to thank um, Marie Mani for inviting me to join this panel discussion as well. Um, okay, for Singapore. Singapore today is internationally recognized as a stable, neutral, pro-business jurisdiction by many of the global players. Uh, like what Caroline has mentioned, right, um, the ease of um, doing business in Singapore. And uh, SGX has also played a very key role in maintaining the relevance and reputation of Singapore as an international financial hub. Right, uh, SGX has um, Asia's most international and connected uh, multi-asset exchange um, with about 40% of our listed companies and over 80% of the bonds originating outside of Singapore. So it's um, high asset under management um, of about 3.4 trillion is one of the reasons why um, uh, it is an attractive financial uh, uh, center. Right, We currently has over 60 maritime and offshore services companies listed on SGX. And we hope to attract uh, more of them here. In terms of the uh, recent development, uh, since February last year, 
MES has introduced um, the Grant for Equity Market Singapore scheme to help uh, issuers defray some of the lifting costs and also to enhance the research ecosystem, which will in turn facilitate better price discovery um, as well as liquidity for the public listed companies. Besides equity grant, um, we also roll out bond grants as well. We have the Green Bond Grant, Asian Bond Grant, and Singapore Credit Rated. So for maritime ocean services companies, as well as uh, logistics uh, related companies, depending on their eligibility, they could get up to 500,000 in terms of subsidy, depending on uh, which grant they look at. Um, most recently, SGX uh, RECCO and NETEC has also announced a regulatory cooperation to help companies to assess capital, uh, capital in both jurisdictions. So we will offer a streamlined framework for issuers primarily uh, listed on NASDAQ seeking a secondary listing on SGX. We hope that this initiative will help to bring additional liquidity with the extended trading hours. And we also hope that, you know, um, listed maritime companies can explore a secondary listing on Singapore to tap uh, into the Asian market. Thank you. I mean, being a banker myself, I'll just probably add that, you know, uh, th there is a bit of work to be done, I guess, in my view, uh, just, just my view on the investor base as well, uh, because capital markets are good at the end of the day, you know, uh, to, to provide that necessary liquidity. I think, you know, the education and upcurving of the of the investor base uh, would, would be good too, uh, so that the, the liquidity is, is, is there uh, in the capital markets specifically. But having, having said that, you know, I think Baltic Exchange is probably the, the only one on the panel, panel that is not a Singapore-based organization. Perhaps my question is to, is to Su Ling, and uh, you've, you've heard, uh, you know, all our panelists. Would you probably ask someone who, who doesn't really um, necessarily is a Singapore-based uh, Singapore uh, organization and have offices actually in other competitors of Singapore, especially London, Shanghai, Athens, Stamford, Houston, uh, what do you see uh, from from an outsider's perspective of of Singapore and and the explanation that that the panelists have just given why Singapore has a premier uh, position? Well, I I think you know I go back to uh, our report um, and the analysis. What really stands out for me is that Singapore, I would say, more than in fact all the other maritime centers that we cover in the in the study, they are it's really an all rounder. Uh, you know, if you look at all the factors that we we cover, uh, and we've been very consistent, the, the factors that we look at have not changed through the years. Um, so, if you look at port factors like throughput, uh, you look at uh, the, the the strength of the shipping clusters across all the dimensions, uh, and if you look at the general business environment, um, you know, which you know, I think Caroline singled out. Singapore is strong in all these areas, and that's why it has been number one. That's that's my view. Yeah. So so I guess you know, like you said, you know, there there there's a plethora of factors, and I did a little bit of work. I frankly I, I just went around asking a couple of industry players as to uh, you know what should be discussed specifically uh, for 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 this panel. And uh, in terms of you know for the past few years, the hot topic in every maritime uh, conference, including Murray Murray, was IMO 2020, which was obviously implemented at the beginning of the year. Uh, but then there has been a severe volatility with respect to the VLSFO prices that have hit highs of 700 uh, metric dollars per metric ton before falling to the lows of 250 dollars per metric ton. Now that was quite a change. So now a, a, a theme that was emerging was given Singapore's position as the world's largest bunkering port amongst all the shipping services that we talked about and carrying a weightage of 50% in your survey or, or, or ranking, you know. The industry players are keen to hear the policies and initiatives, uh, especially with regards to, uh, you know, ensuring that Singapore can actually continue to lead the way, not only with the IMO 2020 compliant fuels, but also remains up the curve for any new tech that is coming or even a new fuel or a replacement uh, that is coming. So, you know, that was, uh, th that was a constant theme emerging that, yes, you've done excellent job, you know, you, you've been great, but, the, but there is a bit of a paradigm that is happening in the world with sustainability and environment and the and in the forefront is is the bunkers and you are the bunker uh, the, the the largest bunkering port so where do you see your evaluation going and um, I, I can probably 
if if uh, if it is fine, then I can ask that question to let's say uh, maybe to Weeting first. Okay. Um, actually, you are right. Uh, I think before you know, COVID became the buzzword for 2020. I'm old. 2020 was the buzzword for a few years, um, and in fact, uh, we have actually been preparing the pot for this since two years ago in 2018. And right to the lead up before uh, first year 2020, uh, we have actually been going around with the oil majors, with bunker suppliers, cargo traders, uh, traders to confirm that there's availability of compliant fuel in Singapore. So this is something that we have done uh, much earlier. And um, actually, you know, we have not faced any issue about the availability. Um, actually, despite COVID, right, I think our bunker sales volume actually went up if we compare period to period uh, last year. So I, I think this goes to show that actually uh, it's a price issue that is actually dependent on, you know, demand supply uh, outside of maybe Singapore. Uh, but, then it, but then the underlying demand uh, has been met. Okay. Um, then in terms of future fuel, uh, this will be a, a, a important question going forward. Um, um, so what we are doing now is that we, need, we want to be able to provide a broad range of uh, fuel solutions. So as you all know, we have been a strong proponent of LNG as an alternative fuel in the meantime. So we are actually building up our infrastructure and also bunkering ecosystem to prepare for this. So in fact, um, LNG is really supplied to um, domestic harbor crafts that is applying uh, within our waters. And by early next year, we will be able to do um, uh, LNG to ocean going ships. And you know, despite LNG is just one part of the equation, um, there is also other carbon neutral type of um, fuel uh, where we are also trying to study the visibility in terms of ammonia, hydrogen. Uh, you know, how how can this work in a, for a future bunkering port? Thank you, Caroline. Any yeah, from actually. Yes, yes, yes. I, I actually, uh, for some years now, IMO 2020 was really very close to my heart. And uh, so it's quite surreal, quite surreal that last year, everything that was on our minds was IMO 2020, availability of fuel, the price difference, um, the fuel compatibility, the suitability to our engines, the compliance, etc. Everything about IMO 2020. And then um, come 1st Gen 2020, it was quite a non-event because availability is there. Yeah, it was there. In, in fact, we saw it in October that um, people start storing uh, the low sulfur fuel uh, waiting for 1st Gen 2020. Um, the storage, the floating storages were full. So I think um, availability can be seen. Um, I am in the bunkering market, so I can really see and feel the pulse of the availability. And I will tell you for a fact that availability is no longer an issue. It was not an issue, and it is no longer an issue. Um, it shows that when there is a demand, the supply will find its way to Singapore. Yeah, Prices have also stabilized. Now, today, um, if I'm not mistaken, BRSFO is uh, 325. MGO is 337, only $12 difference. The preference is still for low sulfur fuel because there is availability. Yeah. High sulfur fuel now is 264. So 264, you compare to low sulfur fuel um, at 325, is about $60 difference. This will actually widen the number of years of return for ships with scrubbers. Um, especially I, um, I hear, and from the markets that we, I'm in, that the prices will remain stable barring unforeseen um, events yeah that's yeah no i guess that was an important question and i thought i will bring it up right in front because uh yeah. COVID, like everybody agrees uh, completely overshadowed one of the biggest events that was supposed to be happening in the industry as of as of last year but that's good to know that uh, that you know singapore is ready looking forward uh lng as a transition fuel uh, and and I guess with that we come to the like like uh, we think rightly said you know the, the next hot topic which is probably the number one hot topic uh, this year is COVID-19. So even though COVID-19 has led to a huge destruction in seaborne demand, we have witnessed many winners during this pandemic in the form of record first half 2020 tanker earnings. Now we can argue with respect to COVID or with respect to OPEC, what was the triggering point? But with respect to flo floating storage, I mean, and there there are no doubts. 
extremely favorable recent financial performances from liner operators are, are also there, which are probably counterintuitive to most of the uh, pundits who, who were, uh, you know, kind of forecasting. And it, 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 it did happen, the, the demand collapse. Now, I also note from Su Ling's presentation, which I'm seeing right now, uh, that these rankings largely reflect pre-COVID times. Because my question is once, and I hope we do that soon, we have to decide, do you all foresee any changes with regards to Singapore's position with, with, with the impact of, of COVID? Alice, any insights of COVID-19 and, and its impact, do you think, on the other side? Um. Yeah, I think um, in order to be prepared that, you know, COVID-19 will be with us for some time, I am, Singapore government has uh, rolled out uh, various uh, COVID-19 measures, right? Uh, and also SME, I mean, small, medium enterprise grant for businesses amounting to 100 billion uh, in total. So, um, waiting has also mentioned here that MPA has rolled out 27 million um, uh, maritime SME the other package as well. From the SGX perspective, I think from uh, we we also do our part. We have rolled out a five million care package to support um, uh, and provide relief during the uh, COVID nineteen outbreak. So contributions were made to community chairs and also to support our listed companies, including the maritime and offshore services companies that are impacted. Because we do see some of the logistics companies. Um, uh, that that are affected. In general, I think they are still doing okay, right? In addition to that, um, FX has also intensified our engagement with the wider capital markets industry, right? Including the shipping community to understand the practical difficulties that they have. So to support them in such unprecedented, uh, challenging times, you know, we have actually extended, um, extended two additional months for our listed companies to, to host their AGM. We also uh, provide grant, uh, AGM grant to help defray some additional costs that they need to host virtual AGM. And um, we also try to enable like acceleration of fundraising efforts by these issuers. So I, I believe with all the various support that Singapore government agencies, um, the exchange, MPA, um, everyone is offering to the shipping industry. Um, we strongly believe that um, this will help to demonstrate and convince um, the maritime companies or Singapore's commitment um, to maintain its uh, top position as a shipping centre. Yeah. So, so that's that's on an absolute basis what, what, what Singapore is, is doing. But so let's say on a relative basis, would you say that the response of the other centers, and I, and I keep coming back to you because you have regional offices of, of substance outside, but it, it, would you say that the response of the other centers also has been more or less in line with that of Singapore? Um, I think without going into details, uh, that's, as we have seen, you know, the, the global response to COVID-19 in general has been really diverse, with very diverse outcomes as well. Uh, no crystal ball. I don't have a crystal ball, but it'll definitely be fascinating to see what next year's, uh, you know, results look, look like. I, I have to say though, and you know, having heard from the other ladies also, um, Singapore has always taken a, I would say, a whole of government approach, right? Coordinated policies, measures, and so on. I think that will stand Singapore in good stead. You know, without predicting the outcome of next year's. Study, I, I think no matter what, Singapore will be fine. It, it continues yeah, to take I, this approach, with, with, as we've already heard. Yeah, but, uh, what, what, basically, what basically, you know, uh, makes me think a little bit is that, uh, you know, with such a big disruption, uh, somewhere along the line, I mean, there has to be some impact, but like you rightly said, it is, it is to be seen and, and observed. Uh, it could be possibly one of the competitive advantages as well, uh, you know, to, to extend the longevity at the leadership position. Uh, but it could also, you know, kind of uh, provide challenges uh, for as well going forward, or provide impetus to the to the other centers um, as as well. But like you rightly said, only the time will tell. But I would not leave the COVID-19 for now. And I would come to a COVID-19 relevant topic, which like Andrew said that very differently this year, we are not sitting in a, 
in a conference hall, but we are on our laptops. And frankly, I don't know which way to go. Sometimes I look at my monitor, sometimes I look at my laptop. So I'm still trying to get to uh, grips with that. But COVID-19 forcing many employees to work from home and many services to go online. Could this be a threat to Singapore? Why I ask is that for your information, as of January 2020, 81% of the Singapore population has access to the internet, which is a far cry from the top five like Iceland, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, and Bahrain with 99% internet penetration rates. So is that a possibility that services, and we talk about services which are which are non-physical in nature, um, you know, could that, could that be that, you know, uh, coming up the curve with respect uh, to work from home or evolving culture uh, may, may pose a bit of a challenge uh, to, to Singapore? Suling, any thoughts you have on that? Um, again, it's quite hard to look out and see what the long term, the longer term impact is. But I do think that companies, whether in shipping or not, they still need to have a base of operations. And if you think about where you want to be located, Singapore is still a very attractive place for companies and and their employees. You know, you've got you've got a, a really strong ecosystem here um, in shipping. Many clusters, you have excellent infrastructure. Um, both physical and even the internet um, infrastructure here is very good. Uh, healthcare is excellent. Singapore's handled COVID-19 very well. So I, I think that all these factors still make Singapore a great place to, to have your business. Uh, and it still has a fantastic strategic location. I think once you know travel can resume, uh, it's still got really good access to the rest of Asia. Still have solid government policy. So uh, all those are strengths for Singapore, regardless. Agreed, and we don't know how long this is going to continue. Alice, any long-term plans for SGX in terms of having a physical office or work from home arrangements? Um, for SGX, actually, we can operate with 90% working from home, right? And it has also shown um, that even with 90% of our employees working from home, we can still maintain a robust trading, uh, risk management, as well as uh, clearing capability the past couple of months, and to ensure that you know the marketplace is available and accessible at all times for our market participants to manage their risk and investments. But with the relaxation of the um, uh, measures, staff are gradually going back to office, Right, we are required to observe um, safe distancing, um, operating from different um, site location, and then operating in a um, split team rotation. But we are still less than, I think, 50% working from office currently. So arising from COVID-19, we also saw the opportunity um, to take our meetings and marketing activities online. So like this uh, virtual marine money conference is the very first time that we have it uh, on a virtual platform. Uh, we have also organized a number of uh, webinars, virtual meetings with clients um, as well. I think it allows us to um, help out a greater audience. So with the acceptance of uh, going virtual, we will likely continue to organize some of these events online and might put in place some working from home arrangements even when things are back to normal. Yeah, thank you. That's 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 very. Um, I think it's it's similar for for most of the places. And and the more I'm I'm drilling into these points, I'm I'm getting convinced that probably you know it's not just uh, that that you know it's a services business. It could be disrupted through technology shift, or it could be just taken away. Uh, I mean, there is a lot more uh, that Singapore offers, including the strategic. Uh, location up to the general environment, which is a perfect synthesis of of actually all the government agencies. And like you guys said, you know they all work in tandem. So so that probably is the competitive advantage. You can take away a, a couple of internet stats and 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 uh, you know uh, compare it with the top percentile. But it does not take away the fact that the other pillars, like we talked about, still stay strong. Now, this is work from home is not possibly an option for people actually. Um, who can work from home but when you think it deeper this is applicable, uh, not applicable to people who actually could not uh, work from home and that's why i came to the physical part of it. we are in extremely difficult times where crew change for hundreds of thousands of crew is becoming a full-blown crisis now as we speak as a 
and, and I'm a very proud ex seafarer myself. So I, I thought I would I would like to ask that question to, um, uh, to to all of you here, and also specifically thank MPA and SSA and their partners for setting up uh, this cause with uh, with the SG Star, which is I think fairly recent, three four uh, weeks old uh, fund. So I I would just probably like to learn a little bit more, and for benefit of the people who are following this crisis as well. Uh, you know, Caroline and, and waiting SSA and, and MPA are part of, of this, and in fact, in the forefront of it from Singapore. So it would be really helpful if you could give tell us, you know, what this fund is, how would it be deployed, and and what is the what is the rationale behind it? Okay, maybe I will start because this is very close to my heart. Yeah. So crew change is really the very immediate challenge of the maritime industry. It is the uppermost in all our minds it consumes our time it is really the one that keeps me awake our crew is our front line they are our essential workers yeah and it is not right to have them on board for this long and not be able to do crew change so but we also have to think in the bigger community context where where there are community cases and uh, we have to make sure that also that the crew is coming in that's doing for going to crew change to go on board to the ships are also safe so that when they go to their ships they are also safe for their colleagues so there is a this context that we're looking at and in Singapore as usual we are so efficient we have um, all the procedures that's in the crew change guidebook and that is um, that's already in its fourth version and it states very clearly what the crew has to do before um, boarding the plane from his home country to Singapore and from Singapore we have a safe and dedicated passage all the way to the ship and vice versa so um, but unfortunately um, we don't have control over the crew supplying countries uh, where most of our crew comes from and that's the areas that uh, we are concerned with and um, this star fund was actually set up precisely to see how we can assist in those areas so um, actually i will tell you that this uh, star fund was set up um, in a conversation um, over two days and um, the tripartite partners of the uh, mpa ssa smou and sos come up with one million singapore dollars literally within two, three days, because we realized that this is so urgent. It's something that we have to do. And we were very lucky to have, because whilst this is a SG initiative, um, is uh, is an initiative by the MPA, we, Singapore cannot do it alone. This has to be an international effort. And we are so pleased to see the onboarding of ITF and um, IMAC, the International Maritime Employers Council, and ICS International Chamber of Shipping. So you have these international organizations who believe in this star fund and that we have to do something about it. Yeah, so um, the task force is already set up. They already have articulated measures. Now they're thinking through the processes. So we need to execute those measures quickly. We need to have quick wins and we need to build on these wins because we need to make sure that we bring our crew in for a very safe crew change, not affecting the community, not affecting their colleagues um, on board the ship. You know? And once we are able to prove that, then we can ramp up capacity and we can be able to bring more crew both ways, sign on and sign off. Bring them home to their families and bring the crew back to the ship to work. So it's really important for the whole of industry to be responsible and to be accountable for the crew change so that we can really do this safely, properly, and we can bring our crew home. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. I mean, I could, yeah. I mean, this, 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 this really is, um, is amazing. And that's why I picked it up. I've just been hearing it about the crisis for a couple of weeks, and then I suddenly heard about this, which has been put together very, very uh, quickly, like you said. So, so really, thank you for and waiting. I mean, your view on uh, on this? Yes, I think uh, Caroline has actually covered a large part of it. I think you can see from what we want to do. Um, I think we can see in two areas. 
uh, number one, it, you know, the situation is actually constantly evolving. Uh, what we are actually offering is that we are constantly working with the industry, working with our partners to make sure that we can come up with the best solution possible at that point in time. Um, so I think right now, I think I heard from my colleagues, we do an average about 200 sign on and about 200 sign off a day. So this is, we are doing our part, uh, but this is a global problem. So we also need, you know, uh, everybody to, to support us uh, in this. And I think you're getting the traction, as I can as I can see. You know, IDF has joined in, and there is a there is a substantial mm -hmm. amount of coverage uh, on this. So I, I hope that you know this this gets addressed as soon as it can get. Um, now moving on, uh, probably coming on towards the end of a session a little bit. Uh, looking at the road ahead for Singapore, if I may ask, what are the initiatives that Singapore can implement to ensure they remain on the top? So you've, you've had seven years of success. You've uh, beautifully laid down the grid that actually puts the competitive landscape. So thank you, Suling, for that. But uh, you know, I, if I also see uh, there has been a rapid ascend of Shanghai from sixth to the third position, and their constant evolution is, is, is happening. And that's why I brought up the point on, on the impact of COVID. So we, if, if I was to ask you, uh, you know, what are the initiatives that you need to take or focus on singly, maybe, you know, what, what would you say so that Singapore, the eighth year and, and remaining years comes on top? Maybe we start with, uh, with, with Suling, any, um, since you see the grid and the rankings. <laughs> well, I think the factors that define successful shipping centers will not fundamentally change. Uh, and Singapore is already doing many of the right things. Uh, the government will continue to have to play an important role, you know, invest in infrastructure, continue to offer conducive policies, uh, remain open to talent, foreign talent included, uh, invest in training and R&D. Uh, all those things have to continue. There won't be any so, one thing. Yeah, so I, I, just, I just wanted to ask you a question on that because I, I did see the, uh, the uh, percentage weightage in the three pillars. And in terms of digitization and in terms of technological advancement, you know, if, if somebody has to measure, you know, what are the ports that are evolving technologically, uh, you, know, you know, the fastest, and I guess, you know, there is no doubt that this is going to be a key KPI. Maybe I was not able to see it here, but, but shouldn't there be one? Because that could, that could change the game substantially. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we've had other people comment as well and ask, you know, how do we measure something like this? Uh, if you look at the criteria we use, it's very important that it has to be based on objective measures. You need to have access to some measure that looks at this factor in a um, credible way across all the centers. We haven't found that yet. So, you know, if there are any suggestions, we're happy, happy to hear that. I mean, we, we'd love to be able to incorporate it, but we don't have a good measure at this point to reflect it. That's 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 a very fair justification actually. But I was just thinking it just came out right on the go when I was looking at your slides as as to I didn't see that. But maybe let me let me also think and probably let the panelists also think if there is something I think that is that can't be kept too far away. But I, I agree with you maybe uh, you know you can't uh, but at the same point in time I believe you can't manage something if you can't measure it. So there there has to be some some measurement. Uh, the the other point that I wanted to probably ask was from uh, uh, from Caroline's perspective. I mean, the insight, you know, the inward uh, uh, perception of of the ship owners, especially the foreign ship owners, uh, you know, over here. What is it that you think, uh, you know, singularly is is driving uh, this this uh, constant, uh, you know, top position? And what do you need to focus on? Okay. Um... On the very immediate uh, front, when I, I read the Tsinghua Baltic Exchange um, um, rankings, and I, we also follow the Menon report, and we, we actually watch the rankings very closely as an industry association, uh, because we really want to be the top. And once you're at the top, that's where you create the vibrancy and the dynamism, and you attract more companies to come in. You attract the right talent. It becomes very, um, very exciting. And maritime is a very exciting industry. So um, for me, immediately when I read the 
the Baltic, um, Singapore Baltic exchange rankings, the first thing that comes to my mind is why am I not doing better in legal, insurance and finance? I need to do better. Why? Because I have the talents, I have the infrastructure. So that's an area that actually as an industry association, we are starting to look at it and see how we can um, Come to the come to and provide some initiatives uh, together with the uh, to be, together with MPA as well. So this is the part where we feel that we we can work a bit more on it. We we have we have what it takes to do. Yeah. And, and if I may just wrap up because there may be a couple of questions coming as well. So last question. If I was just to ask you guys, you know, what is this is the area of focus, but what is the area of threat? One tangible threat that you see that can displace uh, Singapore from this position. And I've, as you can see, I tried everything. I tried COVID, I tried digitization. So something probably coming from, from you, you know, uh, as, as a threat that can dislodge potential this position. Anybody? It's, it's an open Okay, question. maybe I, I, will, I will start with this. Um, I've been thinking about this quite a bit and we have raised it actually on several platforms. Uh, very honestly for Maritime, our one greatest threat is we turn inwards. Yeah. In one meeting where Minister Ong Yi Kang was present, uh, the Minister of Transport, he said uh, maritime is, if domestic, is meaningless for Singapore. And that is, that is the blunt truth. Yeah. So I, 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 I was very glad to hear this because um, it is imperative to our survival that we remain open to trade and to people. We need to have a social compact with the international companies. They must see it in their interest to transfer knowledge to the local workforce within their companies. Transparency in the employment process is also important because once you have transparency, people understand why um, talents are being hired. On the other hand, Singapore must be welcoming to such talents. Two-way street, I really see that dynamic relationship in maritime between the foreigners, between the foreigners who became Singaporeans and Singaporeans, relationship that is vibrant and robust. So in you can see this very clearly in the diversity in the council members of uh, SSA. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a very, very, very thought out, uh, thought out point actually. It, it is a real threat and does I think the preamble of the whole uh, panel was that you know it's a it's a human capital that Singapore created. In. So it really fits in very well with that. Anybody else? Any closing yeah. comments before I hand over to my questions? Yeah, uh, yeah. Waiting. Uh, I think I fully agree with Caroline. So you know, um, shipping is such an international industry, and we really need um, global talent to be here. Uh, so at the government, you know, we want to welcome you know global talent to be here. And also at the same time, we want to help locals find meaningful jobs also. As, as you can see, you know, I shared much earlier at the start of this, we have actually a lot of programs in place. So we need to do that um, together. Um, and also more importantly, uh, we want to be a place of business. You know, uh, if you are business, you, you know, the basic sort of factor must be, you must be able to do business here. You must be able to talk to different parties that is here to conclude your business and also to be able to transact um, transparently and also um, uh, clearly, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we come to an end of uh, the, the panel. I'll hand over to Andrew. Andrew, do you have any questions? Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, thank you uh, also to Caroline, Wei Ting, Alice and Su Ling uh, for that great opening uh, discussion, providing some detail on how Singapore is planning ahead and maintaining its competitiveness as the world's leading maritime center. In fact, uh, Marine Money 2 has had a presence in Singapore for almost 20 years um, and seen the tremendous growth and development not only of the country itself, but also its vibrant and innovative entrepreneurial shipping industry. So that's uh, very positive news. So we have a couple of um, questions that have come in um, from the floor. I mean, um, they're quite they're quite varied in nature. I'll just I'll just ask them uh, a, a bit randomly. Um, so two two kind of questions on digitization. Um, okay, one question is. Um, 
there is more and more dig digitization and virtual business and this is almost certainly the future but this is also borderless in that it matters less where you are as long as you are well connected to the internet singapore has shown strength in this area but could it also be a threat if businesses decide to have their digital employees in less expensive areas and then kind of a a, a similar a similar question um, is uh, is it possible that Singapore will promote virtual companies to operate in Singapore so that people can be physically can physically be in another country and yet use a Singaporean company? Any any views on that? Maybe start with uh, waiting. Okay. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think the COVID has actually accelerated you know, the digitalization. Uh, if you go back to January, I don't think the shipping industry, I think we don't, we don't think that we will be able to work from home. Uh, but then in terms of the platforms, I think we need to look at the, the, the different products that you're actually trying to do. I think certain um, sort of commoditized or easier, you know, easier form of transactions, I think that could, you know, you can actually go online fully. But if you're talking about very expensive assets or even financing, I'm sure you want to meet your ship owner first, right? Before you actually conclude a transaction. So I think certain things you still need to be present uh, to be able to conclude, you know, uh, the, the transaction. Um, and the point about virtual companies, actually that's something interesting for us to consider. Uh, honestly, you know, this is a concept, you know, we always talk about companies being a physical uh, place in office with a physical, uh, people and what does it mean in a in a world where you know everything can be connected? Uh, I think this is something to be studied. Thank you. Um, another question um, on yeah okay. So the question is: some newspapers reports suggest that the government is tightening tightening up on jobs for foreigners in order to protect the jobs for Singaporeans. Might this affect the international nature of the Singapore maritime and financial hub going forward? Maybe Caroline. Okay, perhaps I will speak from the industry point of view because. Um, all applications for, for employment goes to the government. But I will tell you that maritime cannot be local. Seafaring is not local. We don't have the seafarers in Singapore. Uh, we require um, the talent from, from um, different countries, uh, different sectors, finance, insurance, um, legal, um, the superintendents, the, all the different talents come from different places. So for maritime, it is a very good mix. And I will tell you from the industry point of view, we do not see, uh, we see a good balance. And and the narrative of um, this, uh, where the, the government is tightening jobs to, to cater for the locals, in, in maritime, we see a very good mix. And, 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 and that's why um, when we speak all the time between ourselves, um, in the industry with my council members who are who are from all 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 nationalities we don't see that happening in maritime so maritime is actually in a in a good space yeah thank you Cara. thank you thank you caroline um a question for abhishek um one of the criteria for singapore having a strong showing is financial services but several international banks for reasons of their own nothing related with singapore are pulling back do you think this might continue and are there new banks and finance sources moving in to replace them so i would say that you know it's, it's a good observation but i'm uh, i mean it's not singapore specific uh, the way the financing landscape is changing is overall globally. The, the, it's, it's not that the banks are retreating. Paradigm shift with respect to where the liquidity is going to come from. Now, there are various reasons. There is obviously, you know, the inward focus of the uh, foreign banks towards uh, their local and domestic economy, which shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, it has happened in global financial crisis as well. You look inwards. So I think that's one thing that has happened. So there is a retreat of liquidity. Then obviously there has been a replacement of liquidity. And the replacement of liquidity is triggered through regulatory changes. Uh, so mainly through the capital allocation norms 
that are being enhanced after the GFC. I mean, there has been a bit of a lag, but obviously the capital requirement that has gone into the industry has become a little bit more as compared to, to before. And that shouldn't also surprise anybody because it's a cyclical industry and it's been some time that we have had, you know, a robust consecutive upcycle. So, uh, so once the capital uh, capital efficiency gets depleted, obviously, you know, the capital the scarcity appears. But the gap that is being uh, left in with the retreating banks is basically liquidity being picked up predominantly through the Chinese banks and through the Chinese leasing companies. The JAL calls, the Japanese operating leases, etc., still stay uh, relevant. But at the end of the day, you know, the the most uh, the highest replacement of bank financing, if you ask me. Has been through the uh, through the Chinese liquidity, both in forms of ECA back transactions, um, uh, attracting uh, liquidity from conventional banks, and also as 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 leasing. So, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, you know uh, it, the the it's it's a panel in itself, possibly. You know what is happening with the with, with the financing, with the alternative investment source of financing coming in. But I would say that Singapore did a fantastic job after 2006. Uh, to you know, get the required impetus into the Asian um, uh, you know shipping industry by attracting the liquidity the way they did through AIS scheme. Uh, you, you had capital markets that were uh, that were quite attractive at that point in time. The tax still remains quite attractive. So, so I think the the ingredients are there, but it's more exogenous when I compare to Singapore, and and I and I'm pretty confident that you know this is the reason. Thank you, Abhishek. Um, indeed, uh, we will be hosting um, a panel discussion on this topic uh, on a Wednesday, this Wednesday at five, as part of our virtual um, Ship Finance Week. Uh, so tune in to to learn more about that topic on Wednesday. Um, just a, a final question uh, from the audience for Su Ling. Uh, the question is: uh, Do you see the potential collaboration between the top leading international maritime centers coming together to share some of the key strengths and offerings? And I mean, you know, the way my 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 perception of this question is kind of like: Is, is there a is there a platform uh, by which to have a dialogue between the international maritime centers and share kind of KPIs and 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 learnings? I'm not sure I can answer this question. Actually, maybe maybe waiting might uh, might have a comment. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. No, yes. I, I, would say, uh, I, I can say shipping is a global business, though, so it's in everyone's interest for shipping to do well. Uh, it's not really a zero sum game, the way I see. It, right. If yeah. you want shipping to do well, you want economies to do well, you want all shipping centers to do well. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think I'll let uh, those two ladies um, perhaps comment more. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, we definitely welcome. We can actually think uh, of how we can actually put together a panel for Singapore Maritime Week. <laughs> uh, but you know that aside, um, we we do actually work quite closely with other international maritime centers because uh, I think like what Suni said, it's not a zero sum game, you know. So different people, uh, different centers are good in different areas. So in fact, you know what I talked about earlier, uh, actually Port of Rotterdam, you know, they are actually part of our MOU in Digital Ocean. So uh, and then in terms of uh, other um, universities, actually our NTU program, we do send the students to other maritime centers. So there's different layers of um, cooperation. Uh, but I think the next thing we can see how we can actually put everybody together for a discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, that brings us to the end of today's uh, opening session. Uh, thank you again to Abhishek, Caroline, Waiting, Alice and Su Ling uh, for being with us today. Uh, for those in the audience who are listening in, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on our website um, later this week. And we will also send a follow-up email in the coming days with um, some contact details. So if your question wasn't answered today, you can follow up with our speakers later in the week. Please note that the second session of our virtual Marine Money Ship Finance Week will uh, be live tomorrow at 5 p.m. Singapore time, and the topic will be Resilience in Adversity, Operations, Investments, and Finance. So please be sure to register and join us for that. That brings us to the end of today's broadcast, and Marine Money once again thanks you for tuning in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Bye.